The M16 has been our nation's service rifle for as long as I've been alive, longer actually. This rifle has served our nation well for over 50 years and its design was revolutionary because so many other rifles have borrowed bits and pieces of it over the last 50 some years. This was the, the brainchild of Eugene Stoner. Most of you watching this video already know the history of the AR-15, M16, and AR-10, so I'm not gonna delve too deeply into that. But the rifle I have here in my hands represents a very early AR-15, or what would be a very early M16 if it had full auto capability. You'll notice it has a three-prong flash hider out on the end of the barrel, has the early triangular hand guards, very lightweight profile barrel, no forward assist, and on this particular SP-1, it has a bolt carrier that doesn't even have the notches in it for the forward assist. The forward assist would become a M16A1 feature, but they would, Colt, they would wind up putting M16A1 type bolt carriers even, even in the AR-15s and the SP-1s that didn't have a forward assist later on in their production. And of course, the rear adjustable uh, sight for windage and your front adjustable sight for elevation. And then even has an early sling swivel on it. So this rifle conceptually was supposed to be a super lightweight select fire rifle for the military. Now this one's not select fire, so this is not the same thing as an M16, regardless of what the mainstream media tells you. But the gun was supposed to be this super lightweight weapon that you could carry lots of ammo for and fire fully automatic or fire semi-automatic, be extremely accurate and just pretty much a multi-role rifle. And it's basically what came out of Russia and Germany early on with the Fedorov and the STG series of rifles from World War II and, and that era. Well, this would be America's version of that intermediate cartridge in a super lightweight select fire rifle. But this rifle didn't stay the same throughout the years of military service. It's gone through a number of different changes. There are sub changes I'm not gonna get into in this video, like the XM177 uh, series and all sorts of various little special operations guns that have been used throughout the years. But the primary issued rifles the only one we didn't bring out this afternoon would be a, a representative that would be for the M16A1. But I did bring out this early SP1. We also brought out a M16 or AR15A2. I think that's a, a very interesting rifle from history. It's really weird to say that because that was my service rifle. <laughs> and then we brought out an M16 or AR15A4 and an M4 carbine. So we wanna talk about the evolution of this as a service rifle and how it's changed from its original concept into what we have today on the modern US battlefield. So let's start off by shooting this old girl. It has a military type sling on it. I'm gonna go ahead and tight sling it like I was taught to do. And then we're just gonna shoot the challenge target at 100 yards. And then we're gonna start talking about some of the different variations of this service rifle in the US military. Such a smooth shooting, amazing rifle. This one has a one in 12 twist, which is a slow twist by today's standards. And we're shooting some American uh, Eagle, which is 223, 55 grain ammunition this afternoon. And we wanna thank our friends over at Federal for sending us that am ammunition because without it, uh, that would be our highest recurring cost. So Federal does supply the ammunition to the channel for free. So let's take a look at some of these other variants that we have out here this afternoon. I think you guys are gonna find them very interesting. We're gonna skip past the M16 AR-15A1, which there really is an AR-15A1, but the forward assist. So the M16A1 was an improved version, obviously, over the original M16. And they made a, a few subtle changes, but probably the biggest change would have been the, uh, the addition of a forward assist. And they started chrome lining the chambers and the barrels and things like that because the very early rifles were having problems in Vietnam. And so, they made some evolutionary changes based on that early feedback of those very early rifles. But the M16A1 served in the military for a long, long time. And then the Marine Corps decided it wanted a marksman's version. They wanted to improve on the M16A1. 
So they went to Colt and with their requirements and the end result was the M16A2. And that's what I have a semi-automatic version of here today. Now this rifle had a heavier barrel profile. It had improved hand guards. And then it also, its biggest change would have been the addition of the micro adjustable, if you will, rear sight. The rear sight now has quick adjustments for elevation and you can fine tune the windage without the use of a bullet tip or a special tool. However, the front post still does require the use of a bullet tip or special tool. It's also worth noting that the original M16 and A1 had a round post and the A2 has a square post offering a slightly different sight picture. They increased the stock length a little bit, making the, sl the stock slightly longer. They changed the profile of the, uh, the forward assist from a teardrop shape to a round shape, and they reinforced the lower receiver on the A2. And this would be the rifle that I would ultimately serve with in the late 80s. And this rifle went on to evolve into the M16A4 that the Marine Corps would adopt later, which we'll show you that here shortly. And I believe the Army also ultimately adopted the A2 before they transitioned over to the M4 carbine. So anyway, let's do a little bit of shooting with this rifle. This one is manufactured by Fulton Armory. This is my baby. The Fulton A2 is a really cool piece of history. Now, when, you come, when it comes to cloning past service rifles, it seems like the A2 doesn't get the attention that all the other variations of the M16 get. Everybody wants, you know, an XM177E2 or, you know, whatever, the GAU from the Air Force or any other variation or rare version of the AR-15 M16. It seems like the A2 gets left behind. And I think that's pretty interesting because this, in my opinion, was really kind of the last of the marksman AR-15s M16s before we transitioned over to rifles that made extensive use of what we call force multipliers, magnified optics, laser designators, things like that. All right, so we'll still a bit of shooting. Again, we're just shooting, shooting some Federal 223-55 grain. Gonna go ahead and load it up. The ping pong paddle, all that stuff was retained. And we're gonna start shooting at a Ipsic kill zone target at 200 yards. You guys get the idea. I had to figure out my hold there uh, on that 200 yard target. I didn't practice that uh, before we started filming this afternoon. So I didn't make any adjustments to elevation. I just kind of was guessing my, my hold over and you might not be able to tell it from the audio, but we have a lot of wind out here this afternoon. I don't know if that's affecting what is going on downrange because I can't really see the target. It's too small. And the target is actually smaller than my front post at 200 yards. So this rifle, I absolutely love. I think the AR-15 M16A2 was an outstanding service rifle, but times change. And the addition of force multipliers like magnified optics and red dot sights and laser designators would become the future. And so let's talk about how this rifle changed from previous iterations into what we know now as the M4 and A4 versions of the M16 series of rifles. So let me start off this segment by saying I'm not an expert on AR-15 M16 history, I'm just going off memory and kind of showing the evolution of the rifle here. So after the M16A2, the military wanted to start using things like magnified optics and laser designators. Now the original M16 AR-15 had a hole in the carrying handle and you could put a little, ma a little magnified scope onto the top of that carrying handle, but that was less than ideal. The military was moving to a universal mounting system, what we know as the 1913 rail section or rails. And that's what they wanted 
the, the M16 to move towards, both with the M4 and the A4 variants. So on this rifle, you'll notice that the carrying handle, which had the rear sight built into it, has been deleted, and in its place, you have a 1913 rail section on top. Now there were, or there are, carrying handles that you can put onto the 1913 rail, so you have your rear sight capability still, still has that combat adjustable A2 rear sight on it for elevation and windage, but the purpose of this move was to use things like red dot sights and magnified optics and things like that. Also, in the A4, they deleted the standard um, hand guards of the A1 and the A2 and replaced it with a half metal, half polymer system known as the CAC rail system or the Knight's Armament rail system. And this would be adopted on the A4 and the M4 rifles. But this has 1913 rail sections all the way around it and you can take these panels off to access the rail sections. You can mount things like this PEC-15, which has a visible daylight laser and infrared a nighttime laser that you would use with nods or night vision equipment, it has an infrared illuminator, things like that. This has a pressure, swi pressure switch, which I've mounted to the vertical grip, which is a CAC vertical grip, but this is used uh, any number of different ways. You can put this pressure switch up here if you want to access it by your fingers or by your thumb, you can move it around wherever you want. It's just an adhesive with Velcro that holds it in place. So the A4, that was its biggest change from the A2. You had the ability now to put different types of modern force multipliers on top. I'm doing the air quotes an awful lot. Um, but you had the ability to put whatever you wanted now on top of the receiver and not have to rely on that carrying handle. Retained though on the A4 variant was the fixed front sight and that would interface again with either the flip-up sight that you see here on the back, or if you take all this stuff off and put the old carrying handle, air quotes again, on there, you'll have your combat adjustable A2 style sights. All right, so this is an FN rifle, and this is part of their collector series. So you'll notice it has the cage number on the mag well, it has the fencing, has the ambi selector lever on it, retained as the A2 length buttstock, and pistol grip with the A2 you know, little finger groove there. The A1 didn't have that. On the collector series, you get the military FN logo versus the commercial logo. And then it just says M16 rifle on the side here. The slip ring from the A2 is retained and that's in part how the CAC rail system is mounted on there. Now let's talk about the RCO. The Marines went with an RCO, which has a specific reticle for leading moving targets in it and elevation holdovers. And this is from Optics Planet. Optics Planet sent this optic out so we could show you what it looks like here in video. Now on top of it, you have this light gathering system, and this would be used on other ACOGs in military service. And what this does is it takes ambient light and magnifies it or, or uses it to illuminate the reticle. This one has a red chevron in it, but there's also green available. A lot of troops in the field will put tape over this because they feel it makes that uh, post, that, that chevron that's illuminated, too bright. It's, it's what's called blooming. It fuzzes out and you don't get that precise chevron uh, appearance, that really sharp point because it's too bright. So you'll find people putting tape over that. The Marines also opted for something that I really dislike about this. And you'll notice it looks a little bit different than your standard ACOG. And that is the inclusion of a kill flash ARD. And what is this device? It looks like mesh inside there. And that's pretty much what it is. It's intended to reduce the glint or glare off the objective side lens. So if you're aiming at an enemy, presumably if the sun hits this lens just right, they'll see you aiming at them because it'll glint off the lens. And yeah, me personally, all this does is jack up the sight picture. Uh, it, it makes, a more narrow field of view. You can't really see everything. And it of course dims the sight picture because less light's getting in because the ARD, but you can take it off. And there's just a bungee system around the base of the ACOG and then a little hook here in the front that holds it in place. All right, so also I, I should mention the PEC-15 that's on here. Uh, this is from Optics Planet as well. We're gonna go ahead and engage 250 yard challenge target. Now you'll notice that you have to get way up on these ACOGs because they have a very, very short eye relief. 
I can also see my front sight post and my sight picture. And of course with the Kill Flash ARD hanging on the side there, it caused a malfunction. So I'm just gonna go ahead and remove this thing entirely, clear that malfunction, and resume shooting. I hate that ARD. So I can see more of what's going on downrange. I've definitely extended the effective range in terms of what I can see at the target area down there. And now I can call my own shots. I can see where these rounds are impacting on steel through the four by magnification, but with using iron sights, all I have is the audio feedback. I can't really see where my rounds are hitting unless I do a lot of shooting, then a gray area will become visible to me back at the 250 yard line. So those multipliers, really do make a difference, but gone is the light weight of the original rifle. The original rifle is several pounds lighter than this thing in its current configuration. So the, the concept of a super lightweight rifle is really exchanged for the addition of these force multipliers, magnified optics, laser designators, all that other stuff, CAC rail systems, and it increases the weight of the rifle substantially. So we're getting back close to what we would have with something like an M14 service rifle in terms of weight. But that trade-off seems to make sense because what you see on here really does give our soldiers the advantage on the battlefield, especially when they're going up against troops that are armed with AKs that don't have as many features on them and they don't have nods like our soldiers do. Uh, this really changes the game in terms of how effective our soldiers and Marines can be on the battlefield. So this is an M4 that would be representative of something that would have been used by a U.S. Army soldier around 2005, 2006. And the reason I say that is this is not my rifle. This is Jason's rifle and he's trying to build a rifle that looks very much like the rifle he used in Iraq during 05, 06. And so you have the ACOG on top and you have the shortened 14 and a half inch barrel. This one, you, it would either be 16 inches for US compliance for civilian rifles, semi-automatics, non-NFA items, uh, but the military would use an, uh, a 14 and a half inch long barrel. It would be step cut here for the mounting of an M203 grenade launcher. So basically it tapers down to the same size right here in diameter as the original A1 barrel. And then this is completely wrong. Jason hasn't gotten around to sourcing a PEC-2, which is what he would have been issued uh, when he was in service. And then this is the light, the actual light that he used while over in Iraq in 0506. So this is representative of really the final evolution of the M16 uh, family of rifles as it currently stands with the US military. The Marines and the Army and most other branches are using some flavor of the M4 rifle now, which includes this collapsible length of pull buttstock. Gone is the fixed buttstock from the A1, A2, A4. Uh, you have this adjustable length of stock, which is going to come in handy for soldiers and Marines, because when you're running body armor, you, you're probably going to run this stock really short. So you have that the thickness of the body armor, then you have that really short eye, a short eye relief of the Trijicon. That becomes very handy. So until another variation of the rifle is developed, right now this is what the military pretty much universally is using. So you'll still find some other flavors of the M16 in service with various branches and units and whatnot, but this would be a standard issue rifle today with some changes. So we're gonna go ahead and engage the 250 yard target. I'm gonna have to guess my hold here. It should be zeroed. Jason zeroed it. And uh, oh yeah, definitely easier to use the ACOG with this shorter stock.
so you get the idea. I'm having to hold for wind. So I, one time I forgot to hold for wind and, and that missed, but I'm holding just a little bit left. I'm favoring left, not the left side of the target, but just favoring left. And um, it's, it's connecting. I can see through the scope. Even during recoil, I can see the group appearing on the target downrange. Again, that's the, it makes these force multipliers like the Trigicon uh, something that's very, very useful. But some of you will probably ask, well, what about close quarters in, in, in engagements? Well, soldiers and Marines are taught how to use these optics in close quarters fighting, but you can also run different things. I mean, some of the gun gamer stuff winds up being used in the military by special operations community and stuff like that, where you're, you're running iron sights off to one side or the other. Uh, you can actually put a red dot sight on top of the ACOG as well for CQB. So there's options out there. So this rifle tries to get back to a small, compact, lightweight system while still maintaining the force multipliers like the lights, the, uh, the laser designators, laser, uh, or the infrared illuminators, and the magnification. So yeah, this is uh, kind of where it's at right now. Very comfortable, easy rifle to shoot, and I think it probably is one of the best military service rifles ever used by the United States in our entire history. And I know some people are going to dispute that, but the M16 has served for so many years. It's our nation's longest serving military service rifle, and it didn't happen by chance. This is a very well vetted, amazing rifle that uh, a lot of world's militaries, a lot of the world's militaries are adopting in some variation of. So yeah, and that the actual design of the rifle is something that's being copied in newer designs as well. Things like the bolt locking system and stuff like that. Very, very neat guns. Yep, I love them. The M16 is amazing. We hope you enjoyed today's video. If you guys have any questions, you can ask those questions down below. We are viewer supported. If you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, there's a link in the description below. You can follow that link to Patreon and consider becoming part of our Patreon family. If you ask questions over there, you have our 110% devoted attention as a Patreon member. Also, please swing by and check out coppercustom.com. All right, we're gonna kind of wrap things up with the early AR-15 and see if we can make some connecting shots at 250 yards iron sights. Thanks for watching everybody and thanks for 11 years of support. We'll talk to you guys soon. Who needs force multipliers? Just even an old Marine like me, <laughs> I can still use my iron sights. I don't need those fancy new toys. Today's young ones, spoiled rotten.